Welcome to the Pension Confident Podcast with me, Philippa Lamb. Now, back in episode 11, we talked about preparing for a happy retirement. This month, we're going to talk about spending rather than saving. What is the best way to manage your money once you retire? And how do you make sure you don't run out? Picture the scene. You've been saving into your pension for decades. Finally, the day has dawned and you're there. You're retiring. But there's a cloud or two on your horizon. You don't know the smartest way to start withdrawing your retirement cash and you don't know how long you'll need to make it last. Most people have big plans for when they retire and they assume they'll be spending less as they get older. They may want to think about long-term care of some variety at the back end. Yes. It's pegging your death to 100 and planning for that makes sense. That's also part of legacy planning, right? So just think about how much you want to leave to people when you do move on. If you've got a defined contribution pension, you can take the money. You know, take as much as you want, when you want, from the age of 55, all that That's going the key up to age, isn't it? But I wouldn't necessarily recommend you do that. So to run through everything you need to think about when you start withdrawing your pension, I'm joined by three expert guests. Mark Jones is Product Director at Legal and General Retail. Hi, Mark. Hello. Next, we have a returning guest and good friend of the podcast, financial journalist and founder of Much More With Less, Faith Archer. Lovely to see you again. Hello. Good to be here. And also back for another appearance is Pension Bee's Head of Product, Martin Pazonka. Welcome back, Martin. Hello. Good to be back. As usual, before we start, please do remember that anything discussed on this podcast should not be regarded as financial advice and when investing, your capital is at risk. So everyone, it is a big day when you retire, isn't it? I know we're not there yet, but after all those years of working and saving, you know, it feels like it's going to be a day to celebrate. Have you ever thought about what you might do the day it happens? I think I'm not entirely sure when I'm going to retire. Because I'm a freelance, I think I'm envisaging much more kind of phased retirement so that I might switch to working part-time rather than full-time. So there won't be a day. So I'm not sure there's necessarily one big day. Maybe maybe there will. Maybe there'll be the last submission of that article. I think for me, lunch, going out for a big lunch, because I wouldn't normally do that on a working day. Yes. That's something I'd look forward to. Yeah, that is a nice idea. I think that rings true. I didn't really see retirement happening because we're all going to have to work a bit longer, right? Um, to find the lifestyles we want. When I quit or mini-retired my career back in Australia, the first thing I did was sleep in. That was it. (laughs) (laughs) We can all identify with that. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Perhaps I'm a little closer, so I've thought about it a little bit. You mean both. A lot closer. And I'm a natural optimist, so I have this wonderful idea that my retirement will coincide with Wales playing at the Rugby World Cup and I go out there and watch them lift it for the first time. That's obviously going to happen as well, yeah. Absolutely. Guaranteed. (laughs) I hope it does. (laughs) It's going to be a big disappointment otherwise, isn't it? (laughs) I mean, a lot of us are beginning to think about retiring sooner, though, aren't we? Because since the pandemic, the number of people in their 50s and 60s who aren't working, it's gone up, hasn't it? I think a quarter of a million. And as I understand it, for more than half of them, that is because they've decided to retire. So we do all need to think a bit about when we might stop working. But it's this question, isn't it, about predicting how long we're going to live? I mean, if you don't know that, how do you know how much to spend and when? You can't predict it. I mean, there's a thing called deathclock.org on the internet. You can plug in some details. and Deathclock.org. Yeah, I've got about 42 years left, according to that. Oh, that's so So all grim. ready to plan it out. <laughs> okay, so that's a- actuarial yeah, tables. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I must admit, I haven't heard of death clock. <laughs> I just went to the boring old Office for National Statistics. I'm 52, so it reckons my average life expectancy is till 87. But I've got a one in four chance of living to 95, a one in 10 chance of living to 99. I don't particularly want to get to 87 and oops, I've run out of money. So I'm basically planning, just assuming that I'm going to live to 100. So that's the basis I'm looking at. A lot of years ahead to be planning for. It absolutely is. And I'm an actuary by trade, so we create ah. some of these numbers. Um, so death well, talk is all about people like you. Then. <laughs> well, yeah. Fortunately, I mean, some people define actuaries as those who know when you're going to die or make sure people are dead on time and all these horrendous ideas. But it only works on mass, as you say. It's all proportions, it's all percentages. So no one knows how long they're going to live for. And more importantly, you run the risk of running out of money. There's also a risk of not spending it and enjoying it. So it's a really big decision on both ways. That's a really good point. I think using 100 is an easy number to remember. So pegging your death to 100 and planning for that makes sense for a lot of people. But like you say, Mark, people don't may not enjoy it. But I guess that's also part of legacy planning, right? So just think about how much you want to leave to people when you do move on. So there's a lot of things to take into account. 
Well, there are, because if you're saying another 10 years beyond what you might actually live, that's a substantial reduction in what you'll spend every year, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. And it depends how much you want to spend. Most people have big plans for when they retire, and they assume they'll be spending less as they get older, and they travel less and different elements. Then potentially they may want to think about long-term care of some variety at the back end. Yes. So it's potential that your spending is higher, drops, potentially goes back up at at the back end as well. I think it's a huge gap. People don't think about how much they have to spend on care later in life. I reckon it's going to be a miss for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. You know, humans have a sort of optimistic bias naturally, right? And they forget about the bad stuff that happens. Yeah, I'm going to need someone to look after me when I get to that age, um, potentially, right? That's why it's important to you know take care of yourself now and all that kind of good stuff. There is a gap for people thinking about that in financial products to sort of suit longer term healthcare. <laughs> So we definitely need to think about this, as we've just established, don't we? But Faith, you can't just take your pension money when you feel like it, can you? So can you just remind us what the rules are? Well, to be fair, in the brave new world of pension freedoms, if you've got a defined contribution pension, you can take the money. Take as much as you want, when you want, from the age of 55. Yeah, so that's that's the key age, isn't it? But I wouldn't necessarily recommend you do that. Because I think what a lot of people forget is that your pension, it's not exactly the same as a savings account. You can only take 25% of your pension savings out tax-free. The rest is taxable. So if you decided, right, I'm going to take the whole lot out in one year, it could push you up the tax bracket so you pay far more in income tax than you need to, than if, for example, you'd spread your withdrawals over several years. Now, there are various ways you can start taking that money when you retire. Should we kick off by explaining what they are how they work, and then I would like to take a look at the pros and cons of that. So, Mark, should we start with annuities? Should we just say what an annuity is? It's a financial product, you buy it when you retire. You buy it when you retire. People get concerned about annuities, they think they're very complicated. I think there are a lot of options which can make it more difficult, but in the simplest way is you have a lump sum you pay, and for that lump sum you're told you will get an amount of money until you die. Whatever happens to you, whatever happens to your health, whatever happens to the economy, whatever happens in the world, it is an absolute guarantee of a fixed amount of money that carries on. There are options that you have, so you can have it increasing, you can have it so it's guaranteed to last a number of years even if you die early, you can have it so it goes to a spouse when you die. All these are elements that will impact the price, so you will get a little less each month. But more important than anything else is I'd really like to get across it. People get a little bit frightened sometimes by financial products. It's a really simple idea. You pay this amount of money that you know, and you get this amount of money that you know until you die. Faith, just so everyone knows what we're talking about, what is drawdown? How is it different to annuity? With an annuity, you hand over a big lump sum in exchange for guaranteed income. With drawdown, you hang on to your money. So it stays invested in the stock market and then you have the freedom to decide how much you withdraw when. And that means you benefit from growth, but potentially also there is that risk that if you spend too much, you could run out of money. Pros and cons to choosing. I think for me, one of the big pros about an annuity is peace of mind. You know what's going to happen. You've handed over your lump sum and you know your income is not going to run out. Unless you choose an annuity that only lasts for a set number of years, it's going to continue for as long as you live. And I guess the good news is annuity rates are linked to interest rates. We've seen interest rates increasing. So now you get more income than you used to. Yes, because for a long time, annuities have looked like, well, not great deal, haven't they? Because interest rates have been so low. And so they're looking really healthy now. Yeah, they're looking a lot more healthy now. So they are looking more healthy, but still... If you go for the drawdown option where you leave your money invested and choose how much you take out when, you are the one that benefits from any investment growth. If you're being optimistic, you know, you hope the stock market will continue rising, that your fund will grow, that if you don't gouge enormous sums out of it, that that money will last you. So it gives you a lot more flexibility, a lot more control with an annuity because you know what you're getting. There's no flexibility if you have a phased retirement. So if you started it while you were still working, you might end up paying more tax. With drawdown, you'd have the flexibility to say, you know what, I'm just going to take small sums while I'm working part time. Okay. And then I'll ramp up and take a bit more later on. And the other option, of course, is you don't have to do one or the other. Yes. So you can use an annuity to guarantee a level that makes you comfortable, gives you the peace of mind referred to. 
which is hugely important to some people, and then maintain some in a drawdown state such that you can then benefit um, from investment growth and perhaps be a little bit more adventurous in your investment choices because you do have that guarantee underpin. Okay, so you're not spending your whole pension pot on annuity. You're chopping a chunk of it out for that and then being a bit more flexible with the rest. Yeah, depending on how much you have in your pension pot, which again is a is a really big, important decision for some people. If you've got a pension pot of over a million pounds, then you've got an awful lot more freedom and less concern about not being able to cover the basics in life. There's these new products being um, kicked around, and I only found out about this yesterday. Our um, Director of Public Affairs reached out to me and said, hey, what do you think about these? And like, I, it's called Decumulation Pathways, and I thought she was talking about Investment Pathways, which is a FCA initiative. Okay. Is this potentially confusing to the consumer? Probably. I was confused. I thought, you know, you're talking about yeah. this other thing. And you know about this stuff, so and that's know, yeah, not great, allegedly. is it? Decumulation Pathways is where you do get the annuity and flexi drawdown blend. And so the customer, or it's proposed to the consumer, there's some modeling that's done that they set aside an amount for the flexible amount. So how much you want to have flexibility of, leave it invested, like you say, and you can grow or decrease, you know, depending on the markets. And then you do have this guaranteed element. Now, the guaranteed element is pulled with other people that buy the product. So it's kind of like an insurance product where other people's funds are put together. So people that die earlier than expected, they forfeit their funds and those that live longer than expected do better. Do better. Well, they have the guaranteed element still yes. paid out to them. So it, it measures the longevity risk or, or accounts for longevity risk by pulling funds. So it's interesting, complicated, but interesting. I, I think that's where it comes down to. It's the level of simplicity against complication. Mm. The, possibly the easiest way to think of them are, are the old fashioned with profit funds, because that's effectively what this is. And the with profit funds worked very, very well for a, a long period of time. Just remind us how they worked. Again, it's it's what's called pooling of risk. So the idea is everyone pays in the same, and depending on what happens, you get paid different amounts out. So that you know, if if someone dies early, they won't get as good value as someone who lives longer. Within. Gambling on how long you're going to live. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I suppose we all are all the time in that respect. Yeah. Um, okay. The big element is the simplicity against the complexity. Uh, for some people, they they will make absolute sense. They will get very comfortable with that. For others, they want the absolute simplicity of, I want to know exactly. And and also the decision-making at different points in your time. Yes. You know, there's a, there's a discussion that the, the one bit I would really be keen to get out is annuities now and nearly always have the option of being underwritten. It's something that's come in Meaning? in the last years. So they will take account of your lifestyle and your state of health. Now, it's really, really important that you answer those questions because depending on your lifestyle, um, for example, if you smoked or if you have smoked or your health, you can get a better value annuity. And that is, just to be clear, because they think you're going to die soon. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the reason. It's a pure economic piece, but it's really, really important that people don't avoid those questions because perhaps they feel a little uncomfortable or perhaps they feel they will be penalised by answering health questions, which in other forms of insurance you might be. That's a really important message to get across. Where I was going from from there is obviously if you take out an annuity as you're older, you will get better value because A, you're older and therefore you, you've got a la la shorter lifespan. But also there is a higher probability of you having something that you can put on this underwritten annuity and therefore get better value as well. The con side of that, of course, is at what age do you want to be making these financial decisions? So it may be that, you know, age 75, 80 might be an opportune time economically to start looking at annuities. But from a peace of mind point of view, yeah. do you really want to have that decision to be taken that far in the future? Yes, yeah, so you age? don't know what sort of situation you're going to be in, what sort of state of health you're going to be in if you leave it that late. Absolutely. It's how much confidence are you going to have? I think what's key there also is just starting early. No matter what product you choose at the end of the day, whether it's annuity, flexible drawdown, start thinking about it as soon as you can, putting money into the pension, getting that beautiful tax relief from the government to top up your pension pot. And then you've got options. Absolutely. You can you can make the choice when you need to make the choice and you're, you're a bit more flexible with it. Is it fair to say people have been frightened of annuities in the past because it's this business of how do you choose which one to go for? I think so. You yeah. have to shop around for one, don't you? And I think people don't feel equipped to do that. How well, how would you do that? Part of the regulations now is if you go to a provider to purchase an annuity, they will 
take you through the quotes or you'll do it online and you have the opportunity to try all different options, see the impact. If another provider would then give you better value for that, the provider you've gone to will tell you that. It is a far more transparent um, piece. So you've got confidence about whether you're getting the best price for the choice that you're making. Hmm. So Faith, would you say that works better now? I think it does work better now. And I think also, I mean, let's face it, people are becoming much more accustomed to shopping around for different financial decisions. If you think about comparing car insurance, home insurance, Mm -hmm. mobile tariffs, and so annuity, it's another financial product. You can look for help, you know, online from a financial advisor, from the person that provides your pension if they offer annuity options. So I think people are getting a greater level of comfort and it is absolutely worth shopping around and comparing what you can get. I think people may have been had concerns about annuities because it's a big decision. You know, you're handing over a big chunk of money yeah. that you have mm-hmm. saved up over decades in return for an income that potentially is going to take you through for the rest of your life. So and it's, you cannot I mean, it's change your mind, can you? No, when once, it's done, it's done. Once you've done, it's done. But I think one of the comfort for me, you were talking about potentially making the decision in later life. And I think for me, I can imagine, you know, if I was 55, 65, I'd be quite happy having a chunk of money in drawdown, keeping an eye on the markets, thinking about how much I should or shouldn't take out. But later in life, 75, 85, I'm not sure I want to be worrying about that. So I could imagine delaying an annuity purchase Exactly as you say, until I'm older and iller, I'm going to get more income and I don't want the hassle of looking at investments and managing them. And so having that combination over time. We did some research and we found that just shy of a million people, 990,000, when over the age of 55 and still at work, were now considering annuities for the first time. That's on top of the 828,000 in that category who already were. Interesting. So it's more than doubled. And I think it is partly because, or largely because of the interest rate rises, meaning you get better value. But I think there's more being discussed in the media now about it. I think people are getting a little bit more comfortable with the idea that it's not one thing is good and one thing is bad. There's a more nuanced, better coverage of this subject in the market. Yeah, as Faith says, people are getting used to shopping around, aren't they? We know what the options are, don't we? We know we need a plan, a withdrawal plan. Shall we get into how you make one? Because there is this big mindset change, Faith, isn't there, when you're switching from saving to spending. And, you know, it's quite difficult to know how to make your money last. I think it is a huge mindset change. I've spent quite a lot of my life making sure I put decent amounts of money in my pension. And I'm very caught. Cool. I'm now kind of counting down the years until I can retire. Quite hopeful I might be able to quit before state pension age. And I'm thinking, yes, I can. part of me is like, yes, I can get hold of that money. I can go travelling. I can. The kids will have left home. I'm out of here. She sounds um, very pleased about that, doesn't she? <laughs> oh, yes. That's <laughs> lots of plans. But on the other hand, there's that kind of like, oh, But if I blow it all, you know, going around the world, having that new kitchen, there's not really going to be much left with me and my my 100-year forecast. And I think if you have spent so much time saving, then the actual reality of spending it, you know, that it can be a big decision. And I think I have a concern that people will have so much fear about running out of money that they won't take enough money to enjoy their retirement properly. Yeah. It's an understandable anxiety, isn't it? horrifying thought to think you might not have enough when you're really old. But horrifying if you you end up on your deathbed thinking, oh my God, I've got all that money left. It's just going to my children. (laughs) But I could have been living it up. This stuff is not easy, is it? So shall we think about the spending sensibly then? I mean, how you reach those sort of decisions? Because obviously, as you say, you don't want to blow the cash, but then you don't want to end up sitting on a huge cash pile when you finally die. So faith. The costs you'll need to cover when you retire, I mean, most things stay the same, don't they? There will be some things that stay the same. You can certainly do some kind of budget looking at what your costs are now, your basic bills, council tax, water, electricity, that yeah. kind of thing. You can also have a serious think about what costs might change um, if you've, if by the time you retire you've finished paying off your mortgage, if you, for example, wouldn't have the same commuting costs or the cost of smart clothes for work. Thinking of it over time, the U-shaped spending pattern, I've seen it described as the Go, go, years, logo and no-go. 
<laughs> so go, go, you're doing all the travelling and the eating out and all the stuff you would have loved to go. Then kind of low go, perhaps your health isn't so good, you can't do so much. And then no go when suddenly your money is going on care costs. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? The care costs. I mean, the other thing that occurs to me is, you know, the, we've seen some very turbulent economic years recently. We're talking about pre-planning here, but, you know, global events like you know, the invasion of Ukraine, cost of living crisis, these are things you can imagine happening, but they are hard to plan for, aren't they? But you do need to factor in some sort of element of unexpected downside when you're thinking about all this. I think it's practically impossible to plan for, isn't it? That I think where the personality comes in as much as anything else, the people who are willing to say, accept this, this will happen. There'll be good times, there'll be bad times. Some of the bad times might be very bad. Some of the good times might be very good. As against those people who think, I really don't want to worry about any of this. I don't want any risk at all. And those people who say, well, I'm willing to take some risk, but I want that underpin. And just assume inflation is going to happen, right? Like we're seeing a massively high rate of inflation at the moment, but over the long term, it's been about 2 3%. Right, and central banks target two percent. So I think most online calculators will will factor that that in. And when you're making your planning, think about, yeah, cool. I need to set aside you know two percent on year on year to cover it. There's also you know the sustainable rate of uh, drawdown that's purported four percent. Do you guys buy into that? So the plan is that you know you assume you're going to get four percent on average return on your investment. So drawdown four percent year on year when you're on the other side of that when you're withdrawing. Does that does that ring true? I'd seen 4% quoted as a figure by the FIRE movement, financial independence, retire early, on the basis that if, you know, year one you took out 4% and you could then take that amount increased by inflation and that would not completely erode your lump sum. I thought it was more if you took out larger sums above the 4% that you might be in serious trouble. Yeah, those guys popularised it, the FIRE movement. I mean, I think it's... A rule of thumb. Yeah. I think it's a rule Not of thumb. A it's, it's, quite, it's, quite a good, it's quite a good way to think about it. In practical terms, ways of preparing for retirement, you know, if you haven't gone the annuity route with your guaranteed income, if you are not lucky enough to have a final salary defined benefit pension where you know exactly what you're getting. So if you're looking at drawdown, there is the risk of what the hell is happening with stock markets. And depending on how stock markets do during your retirement, you know, whether they soar at the beginning of your retirement or plummet at the beginning of retirement can make a big difference to how much money you're left with. But one of the really practical things you can do is make sure you've got a decent slug of money in cash, at least a year's living expenses, because that does mean if you're doing drawdown and potentially at the mercy of the markets, if everything goes to hell in a handbasket, you don't have to sell yeah. your investments when prices are low. You can yeah. get by using the cash. And I think also in early retirement, if you've identified in your budget, what are your essentials, then you might make decisions, depending on how your investments are doing, to kind of rein things in a bit. Yeah, it gives you, you a know, bit of slack, spend a bit more. Yeah. But that's what I mean about you may have to monitor things. And so that's that's a personality, that's an age, that's a health. How much do you want to be thinking about managing your money? Another thing that is a mindset change at the point that you start retirement is that you may be going from a single income stream to funding your retirement from multiple different places. So, you know, the state pension will kick in you know, 67 plus, I think, well, 66 currently, but the age is rising. Lots of people actually have multiple workplace pensions now. So you've got different pots in different places. You might be lucky enough that some of them are final salary, others in defined contribution. But also you might have savings and investments outside pensions. ISAs, that sort of thing. Buy to let. You might get an inheritance at some point. So there may be this patchwork of amounts of money that you're trying to work out what to spend when. So you really do need a plan. I mean, this is the message of the podcast, isn't it? You do need to think about this stuff. And before the moment arrives, when you need to make the decision. Yeah, because decisions you you can make can last for the rest of your life. Yeah. You know, if you buy an annuity, if you hand your money over to scammers, if you take a massive withdrawal from your pension and then carry on working, that will restrict how much money you can pay into a pension in future. It can really cut down on the amount of, therefore, of pension tax relief you can get. So there are big decisions that have lasting effects. Yeah. So this can all sound a bit anxiety inducing, but I think the thing to reiterate is the more you think about it, the more you plan, the lower your risk of a bad outcome, right? Yes. It is. And there's an awful lot of tools available to help people with this. I think most financial institutions will have tools on their websites. The government have you know, the pension-wise opportunity where 
you know, you have a free service that you get some advice. Yeah, we've talked about that on podcasts. Ourselves, Legal in General, we have a retirement planning course that we've done with the Open University. It's independent, it's unbiased, and it'll just help you think about a lot of these things as you go through that course. I mean, that brings me to kind of pretty much my final question, which was when should you start working on this withdrawal plan we've been talking about? But as you say, those tools are there. And there's no reason why you can't have a little play with those at any stage. You don't have to be imminently thinking about retirement, do you? It's just that idea of thinking ahead. What might you do? How might it work? What resources have you got? Yeah. And the free PensionWise appointments, those appointments are available from the age of 50. Yeah. So that's so well worth you, doing. You definitely worth doing. It's completely free. They're not going to, it's guidance explaining what your options are. So what you could do, not necessarily what you should do. Before we wrap up, I do think it's worth remembering that getting older, you know, always sounds like it's totally bad news because uh, actually there are quite a few benefits, aren't there? There are kind of price reductions, things like that you can take advantage of that young people do not get. I'm thinking about reduced prices, galleries, cinemas, that sort of thing. Benefits too. <laughs> yep, all the discounts you can get. So you're laughing, but system. this is all cash. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've 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 written I've written articles listing um, reams of them. Go on then, tell um, us, hey, tell us. <laughs> well, all the things like the getting news. a senior rail card, getting a free bus pass, getting reduced membership of things like the National Trust and English Heritage. You know, if you look out for pensioner specials in especially kind of lunch times and cafes, restaurants, pubs, the fact that once you're retired, you're no longer tied to travelling. You know, my big love, yep. um, travelling during school holidays and at peak times, you can yeah. you know. Go Saving. midweek, you can go you know, off off season and take advantage of significantly reduced prices. There are many things to look forward to. You see, it's like I said, it's not all bad news. Well, it's beautiful weather at the moment. My 81-year-old <laughs> father-in-law went off cycling around the Purbex yesterday. It's not a financial thing, but it's a gorgeous benefit. <sighs> time. Yeah, you cannot buy time. It sounds good to me. Once more before we go, please remember that anything discussed on the podcast should not be regarded as financial advice. And when investing, your capital is at risk. To catch this and all future episodes, subscribe on your podcast app. They'll arrive the moment they're released. And why not give us a rating and review while you're at it? It doesn't take a moment. Thanks for being with us. See you next time. Mm-hmm.